Okay, welcome back. Hope you had a nice weekend. The weather was fairly nice over the weekend. Um, last class, we talked about the, about the multigrid method, and there were a couple things that I didn't get time to show you last time, so I'll just uh, make a few comments about that right now. One is we use the multigrid method to solve a fairly simple problem a problem that was just a Laplacian and uh, we we saw that the error tended to be smooth as we applied the smoother and I want to show you what happens in a slightly more difficult case in an anisotropic diffusion problem where the diffusion in one direction is stronger than the diffusion in another direction and here I just have an example five-point matrix I guess the uh, screen is cut off a little bit. So here is an example for the five-point matrix. And the diagonals in this five-point matrix are just four on the main diagonal. Is it four on the main diagonal? No, so 2.1 on the main diagonal, then minus ones in the closest main diagonal and then minus uh, 0 0.05 in the far diagonal. So in other words, along one direction the diffusion is fast and in another direction the diffusion is slow. And I want to show you, and this is on the regular grid, I want to show you what the uh, error looks like after we apply the smoother in this case. And the driver program looks like this. I'm going to generate the second version of the problem, okay, and then I'm going to take a number of iterations and I'm going to plot the error after I've done a smoothing step using Gauss-Seidel, okay. And I've uh, checked in some of these codes, which I'll explain in a moment. So in MATLAB, if we run this driver, so this is the initial error, which is random, okay. And then after one smoothing step, two smoothing steps, three, four. Okay, you can see what is going on now. So the error kind of looks smooth. The error is smooth in this up-down direction, okay, but in the left-right direction it is not smooth. Okay. So what would happen if we applied our standard multigrid algorithm. If we interpolate in this direction, the interpolation will be very poor. So we should not interpolate in that direction, and we should only interpolate in this up-down direction. Okay? So this tells you how sometimes these multigrid methods have to be adapted to suit the problem. So in this case, which is called geometric multigrid, because we have the coordinates of the grid points, and it's on a regular Cartesian mesh, a number of things can be done. One is to try to design a smoother, uh, th this is the main thing that has been done, try to design a smoother that will, even for this anisotropic problem, make the problem smooth in all directions. Okay? The second, two other things can be done. One is to only coarsen in the smooth direction. Okay? Meaning that when we look at our um, coarse grid points compared to all of the points on the fine grid. We only coarsen in one direction. That's sometimes called semi-coarsening. And then the third option is to try to build an interpolation operator that matches the problem. So sometimes that's called um, operator-dependent interpolation. Okay, so those are just some ideas. The specifics are not so interesting. I think the main point is to understand that the error is not necessarily going to look geometrically smooth. Okay? Sometimes it will be an error that is more, it's maybe more precise to say that the error is slow to converge. Right? In some cases it looks geometrically smooth, but we want to be able to interpolate this slow to converge error on the coarser grid. Okay? So that's an example and then what I've checked in, what I've checked in, what I've posted on the website 
is a one-dimensional version of the multigrid code. Actually, let me just show you that. Um, so here is the multigrid code that corresponds to the uh, code, the pseudocode that I put up on the board last time. Okay, so first there is some setup of the problem. Okay, so this is the, the core algorithm, right? We're going to say this is a prolongator, uh, and there's a function that I created that does linear interp that does linear interpolation, and the restriction operator is just a constant times the transpose of the interpolation operator. Okay, so this is the pre-smoothing guess. We're just the pre-smoothing step. We're going to just run Gauss-Seidel for one step. Okay, so now we have. So this is on the error equation. Then we have the error on the course on the fine grid. Okay. We compute the residual and we restrict that to the course grid. So now this is the residual on the course grid. Okay. And then we can compute the course grid operator using the Galerkin formula, restriction times the matrix times the prolongation. But another thing that you can do is to rediscretize on the fine grid, and that's what I've done here. So I've tried both, and both works. Um, so here I've just said, well, just generate the 1D problem again, and this time use the smaller grid. Okay? And then to solve the course grid problem, we just call multigrid again, right? Using the, res using the residual on the course grid, using the uh, matrix on the course grid. And we keep calling it until the matrix is small enough. So in this case, less if the dimension of the problem is, less than, is greater than 20, or is less than 20, less than or equal to 20, then I'm just going to solve exactly on the course grid. Okay? And then after we do the course grid solve, we transfer the course grid error onto the fine grid using the prolongation operator, and then we correct and then we have a, a course grid correction. Sorry, a, a post, post smoothing. A post smoothing. OK, and that's the end of the file. So it's very simple, right? As an idea for a project, you might want to write a 2D version of multigrid. So this was 1D. 2D version of multigrid, um, what would you need to change? So in fact, this part of the code, this whole file, except for maybe this part, so if we, let's say, use the Galerkin course grid operator, the file would be exactly the same. You don't have to change anything, okay? but you do have to change the prolongation operator at the top. Okay, so you will have to change this, because this, this thing that I've written is for interpolation in one dimension, you'll have to write an interpolation in two dimensions. And similarly, writing it in three dimensions is also not hard. And once you have, interp once you have a 2D problem, then you can solve much more interesting problems, and you can also experiment with much more interesting smoothers. So um, <coughs> smoothing in one dimension is you know, there, there's just very limited numbers of things that you can do that, that can be different. Okay, so let me show you the prolongation operator in this case. Okay, so this is a very simple operator. Okay, so you would have to change this if you wanted to do the 2D version. So these files are checked in on the website and you can take a look. And I was asked also to say a few words about something called algebraic multigrid. Um, what I've also put on the website is a technical report that describes um, algebraic multigrid, I think in a very clear way. It's a long technical report, and the technical report later became an appendix to a book, and it was the uh, report that I used to learn about um, algebraic multigrid a long time ago. I, f I think it, it is very, very useful, so it's on the website. Um, but let me s tell you what algebraic multigrid is. So in, in what we've described so far, we uh, applied multigrid to a problem, very regular problem on a Cartesian 
on a Cartesian grid. And it was very easy to figure out what the coarse grid problems are in that case. In algebraic multigrid, the idea is that someone just gives you a matrix. Okay, you have no coordinates for the for the mesh. And the idea and the question, how do you de define a multigrid method when someone just gives you a matrix? And the idea in algebraic multigrid is um, you have to change two different things compared to geometric multigrid. So, so geometric multigrid, um, so the idea of al algebraic multigrid is the same fundamentally as geometric multigrid. You just have some, uh, you, you, you have, you smooth the error and then you try to project this error onto a coarser grid. So again, more precisely called algebra, uh, slow to converge error. And the way that you do that is you have a set of variables and you select a subset of the variables as coarse grid points and you keep all of the rest as fine grid points. Okay, so that's one difference. So, so we also had coarse grid points in, in geometric multigrid but that would, those, those coarse grid points were easy to, uh, easy to choose. So you somehow we have to decide what are points that, which points influence other points in, in a particularly strong way. Okay, so selecting these coarse grid points is the, is the first idea. And then the second idea is how to construct interpolation. So obviously linear interpolation is no longer going to work. So how do you construct these interpolation operators? And generally the transpose of interpolation will be used for, for restriction. Okay, so that is the main idea. The details, I think, are not so interesting. Um, they are in that tec technical report, but the fundamental ideas are the same in multigrid methods, but the adaptations in algebraic multigrid is choosing these coarse grid points and then choosing the interpolation operator. Okay? Any questions about this before we leave multigrid? Okay, so let me go on to uh, the main thing I want to do in today's lecture. And uh, today I will use a set of slides. And the topic today is on uh, graph and hypergraph partitioning. And a couple references first, where I, th I think very good uh, papers, um, and I've taken some images from these papers to use as examples. And graph and hypergraph partitioning traditionally thought of as methods for paralyzing sparse matrix vector products. Okay, so remember in parallel algorithms for solving sparse linear systems using iterative methods, one of the main operations that needs to be performed is the sparse matrix vector product. Okay, so here we have a matrix A, I'm going to multiply it by a vector P, sorry, a vector X, okay, to get the vector Y. And I'm assuming that I have P processors, okay, and I'm going to partition the problem row-wise, okay, so that processor I stores the ith block row of A and stores XI and we'll compute yi, yi, okay? So w the idea is that the problem is so large that we can't store the matrix on a single processor. We'll have to store it on several different processors that don't share memory. Sometimes I call them compute nodes, but uh, I will also use the words node later on when I'm talking about graphs. And 
and also that the problem is so large that I want to use multiple processors in order to do the matrix vector multiply rather than to rely on a single processor to do this. Okay, so there are many ways of partitioning the problem. This is one of the simplest, which is just a block, uh, block row-wise partitioning. Okay. So if the matrix is partitioned, or the system matrices and vectors are partitioned this way, then how do you do the matrix vector multiply? So here is the pseudocode that you that um, says what would be executed on one processor. So let's say processor I. Okay. And you can see here that let's say processor one. So processor one needs to compute this product of all these blocks or submatrices with all of these guys. And in the sparse case, okay, some of these blocks will be zero. Okay? And in general, some of these blocks will be sparse. Okay? I've written it out, out in this dense format, but, but keep in mind that we're really interested in the sparse case. Okay? In order to compute Y1, the first processor needs some components of X that it does not already store, right? It don't, X, processor one only stores uh, X1, so it does not store these other components of X, okay? But it can immediately compute A11 times X1, which I can call the local portion of Y, okay? So there needs to be some communication between the processors. And XI can send the components that it owns to other processors that needs those components. Okay? So it doesn't have to be all of X1. It could be just some components of X1. And then similarly, it and other processors receive these components that, are, that, it, that they need. And I've written it in this slightly strange way that I do the send and then the compute and then the receive to emphasize the fact that this communication can be overlapped with this computation that is for Y local. Okay? So once these external components of X are received, then we can compute this external component of Y. And here by external, I mean all of the other components, you can call them J, that are needed in order to compute these other blocks. Okay? And then we can form the final product. So in particular, something to notice is that if processor I, let's say processor 1, contains non-zeros in column K over here, let's say in column K, then XK is going to be needed in the computation. Okay? All right. So here's where the uh, graph part comes in. And the graph model shows you which non-zeros in the sparse matrix will induce communication in the sparse matrix vector product. Okay, so here's a sparse matrix. And this is for the p equals 2 case, so just two partitions. Okay. And you can see that this is, let's say, A11 right this is y1 and y1 can be computed as this local part this times that without any communication by the first processor okay but then this part times this part needs communication be because these portions of x and we only need 6 7 and 8 right these portions of x are not stored on processor 1 so these need to be communicated and the fact that these need to be communicated is exactly due to the fact that there are non-zeros in this block. And there, there are non-zeros in this block. And I believe this is, this is a symmetric problem. Okay? So here is the graph of the sparse matrix. And these two circles, these two large ovals, show you how the vertices have been partitioned corresponding to this partitioning. Okay, we're going to put variables 1 to 5 in the first partition. So you can see 
uh, v1, v1, v2, v3, v4, v5 are in the first partition, and then 6 to 10 are in the second partition. Okay, And you can see that, and these are the edges between the vertices, and you can see that some of the edges cross between two partitions. Okay. And an edge that crosses between two partitions means that it is in this off-diagonal block. So here, 4, 5 means that there is a non-zero 4, 5, uh, 4, 5, that, no, sorry, not 4, 5, 5, 7. I was looking for 4, 5, it wasn't there. So there's 5, 7, right, and it's in the off-diagonal block, okay? So you can see that each one of these, um, each one of these edges correspond to non-zeros over here. Now, the, each edge has a weight of 2 because there is a non-zero um, VA57 and a non-zero A75. So in both directions, this is why each weight has non-zero in this diagram, is 2 in this diagram. And then for each vertex, we also have a weight which corresponds to the amount of work that needs to be done for that row. Okay, so for instance, V5 has weight 4. That means that there are four non-zeros in that row. It needs to do four multiplies. Okay? So if you want to reduce the amount of communication, you want to try to find a partitioning, and in this case it's a reordering and then a cut, right? So you want to find a partitioning of the vertices such that you minimize the number of these edges that are cut. Okay? And you also want to find a partitioning such that the sum of the number of non-zeros in each Partition, which is a sum of the numbers in these circles, is about equal because you want the amount of work to be done by each node to be about equal. Okay, so this leads us to the slightly more formal way of describing the graph partitioning problem. So given a graph with, which is a set of vertices and a set of edges and a number of parts, lowercase p, we want to find a partitioning of the vertices into p parts. Okay, so each PI contains a subset of the vertices, and the PIs are disjoint and complete. Okay, so they don't overlap, and all of the vertices are, each vertice, vertex is in, in at least one of these parts. And the number of vertices in each partition is approximately equal. That's just expressed this way. So this is the average number of, of vertices in each partition. You want actual numbers to be um, less than this average times some kind of threshold that is just a little bit larger than one. So this measures some kind of load imbalance. Okay, and the number of cut edges is minimized. The cut edge is an edge that straddles two partitions, or two or more partitions. I should say uh, it can't straddle two or more. It can only straddle two partitions. So this problem is NP-hard, so what people do in, instead of trying to solve it exactly is to try to find some approximate algorithms to find these partitions. Okay? So the idea, again, overall, try to reduce the amount of communication, try to balance the load on each node, um, and one way to do that is to uh, solve this graph partitioning problem, an abstract problem that can be solved using uh, a number of different techniques, which we'll see in a moment. Okay, if you have a very large problem, a very corresponding to a very large graph, um, the idea is to use a multi-level graph partitioning approach. Okay, so this is, you know, we talked about multi-grid last time for solving very large problems. Sometimes very large problems can be managed by trying to use a multi-level type of approach. And the overall strategy is that starting with some kind of graph, big graph, 
we're going to try to coarsen the graph by making a smaller version of it. Okay, then coarsen again, making a smaller version of it. Coarsen again. Okay, so this is like restricting onto a coarser grid, but we don't have coarser grids. We're just going to try to find these smaller graphs until this graph is small enough. And then we're just going to try to partition the small graph really well using some kind of method, not necessarily specified. Okay? And then we want, but we still want to find the partitioning on the, on, of the original graph. And what we're going to do is we're going to uncoarsen. After we have this, we can uncoarsen. And every time we uncoarsen, we're going to try to also refine the partition, refine this partition that is uncoarsened. And we repeat until we get back to the size of the original graph. Okay. So let's see. So here's um, how we, I'm going to explain the different steps. I'm going to explain the uh, coarsening. I'm going to explain one algorithm for doing this partitioning. And then I'm going to explain the refinement as we uncoarsen. OK? So here is a, a way of coarsening a graph. So Take as an, an example this graph and ignore the uh, red edges for now. Okay, so we have vertices and edges, and we have weights on the edges. And the weights initially are all one, okay, or actually they were two in the previous example. Um, and you'll see how the weights actually change. And what we're going to do to make a smaller version of this graph is to collapse some of the vertices together. So if two vertices are joined by an edge, okay, we're going to uh, potentially combine them together to make a smaller graph. Smaller meaning fewer vertices. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to choose a matching in the graph. And a matching is defined as a set of edges such that no two edges share a vertex. So here, um, now we look at the, the red edges. And you can see that this is a matching. It's a set of edges. And there's no two red edges that are coincident onto some vertex. Okay. And once we do this collapse, because so these two edges are going to be joined together. Okay. And this is what we get the numbers in the square brackets is the new vertex weight. So they originally had all vertex weights 1, so now they all have vertex weights 2. And the numbers on the edges are the new edge weights. So how do we get these new edge weights? So let's consider um, this thing. So this became, so collapsing these two gave us this. Collapsing these two gave us that, okay? And between this new vertex in this graph over here and this new vertex formed by collapsing over here, how many edges, what's the total edge weight? You can see that these two edges got collapsed together as a, f as a result of collapsing the vertices together. And the total is five over here. So this explains the 5, the new edge weight 5 over here. OK. So this is the coarsening process. We, we can then repeat the coarsening on this graph by choosing uh, edges that have high weight as, as much as possible in our matching. And the advantage of choosing edges with high weight is that more of the edges get um, get represented together in the coarser graph. OK, so this is the coarsening stage. And then for the, um, parti partitioning the coarsest level graph, there are a number of things that you can do. And this is just one example of something that you can do, something called levelized nested dissection. And ignore 
ignore these two lines for now. The idea is you start with some vertex and you do something like breadth first ordering of the vertices. So you go through the entire graph. So one, two, these are a distance of one from this root node. These are a distance of two, these are a distance of three. And you go through until you find, um, you go through until all of the distances are labeled. Okay? And then you go through again using a breadth first ordering until exactly half of the vertices are labeled. So I don't know what exactly half is, but once you do exactly half, you, it corresponds to this solid line over here. And the edge cut here is eight. If you cut, count the number of edges that are cut, that's eight. Okay? So that's one way of trying to um, partition a graph. And you can see that edge cut of eight is actually not the best here. There's also an edge cut of three. Okay? To get an edge cut of three, you can try to refine this edge cut of eight. Um, and, and that's the next step. So this explains why refinement edge, this partition refinement might be important as well. Um, and you also do this partition refinement after each coarsening step when you're un after each uncoarsening step in the multi-level algorithm. Okay. So I'll explain two kinds of refinement algorithms. The first one, the one that was in invented first by Kernighan Lin. So this is called the Kernighan Lin algorithm. So here is a graph and this is some partition. It has an edge cut of one, two, three, four, five, six. And we're going to try to refine this partition so that the edge cut is lower. Okay? And the idea is to try to find pairs of vertices, one on either side of the partition. Okay? So this one is on the left side of the partition, this one is on the right side of the partition. Try to find pairs of vertices such that when you move the vertex from one side to the other, so we'll move this one to the other side and we'll move this one to the other side, okay? then the new number of edge cuts is better, in other words, lower. Okay? And this is the result after we've swapped those two partitions. So by finding one on either side and then swap, swapping, then the total number of vertices on each side remains the same. Right? So it stays balanced. And we're going to do this process until all of, so in the kernighan lin algorithm, we repeat this process until all of the nodes have been moved at least once, and actually exactly once, and then we um, go back and see which is the partitioning partition that gave us the best edge cut. Okay? And then we repeat this entire process again until the best configuration no longer changes. Okay? But the main idea is that we're going to try to find these pairs and then swap ownership. Okay, so that's the kernighan lin algorithm. And a slight improvement to the algorithm that is maybe a little bit faster is the fiducia matheses algorithm. Okay, so here, instead of finding pairs, we're just going to try to find a single vertex. And we're going to change that single vertex from one partition to the next partition. Okay. And so how do you decide which partition to choose? So for each vertex, you can calculate something called the gain. And the gain is how much the edge cut improves if the vertex changes partition. Okay, so if we move this one over here, okay, then it actually gets worse. I think it gets worse by one, so these weights are minus one, okay, so they don't improve. So we can find um, how things imp improve, and these are all these gains, and they all happen to be negative in this case. And we're going to try to, we're going to choose the vertex with the best gain, okay, and in this case it's 
it's this one. There's a bunch of ties, but we're going to choose this one. Okay, and we're going to move that over. And when we move this one over, some of the other gains get changed as well. Okay. So these are the updated gains. And these gains can be updated, some, I think, using a local algorithm. OK, so, so, uh, so this got moved. OK, you can see that the edge cut increased after the move. It was 6. Now it's 7. OK, and these are the new gains. OK, now so this, this vertex, its gain got changed to plus 1. And I think uh, this one got changed to minus 3. This is minus 1. Um, so the best one, we're we're, the one that we're going to choose next is this minus 1 over here. OK. No, this, this minus 1 over here. And this has been colored black because it has been moved. Once it has been moved, we're no longer going to try to move it again until all of the other ones have been moved. Okay? So that's one pass through this algorithm is to try to move all of them at least once. Okay, so this one is the next candidate to move. So it moves to the other side. Okay. This one is the next candidate to move. It's going to move to the other side. And the process repeats. And eventually, we find an edge cut of 2, which is much better than the edge cut that we orig originally had, which was 6. So it has a way of climbing out of local minimum. You can see that, that in this original configuration, there was actually no vertex that should be moved that would improve. Right? It actually got worse 7, 8, before it actually got better. Okay, so that is, this is another uh, refinement algorithm that can be used. Okay. So we've talked about how graph partitioning can be used to try to minimize the amount of communication. There is, however, a deficiency with graph partitioning. And that is, we're trying to minimize the cut size, but the cut size does not measure the communication volume. Okay, so going back to this example, the cut size is 8, right? And it really means that there are 8 non-zeros in these off-diagonal blocks. Okay? But how much communication is actually needed? Processor 1 actually only needs 3 components. It only needs x6, x7, and x8. Okay? And processor 2 only needs three components as well. It only needs components x1, x3, and x4. Okay? So by minimizing the number of non-zeros over here and over here, is not that's not exactly the metric that you want. What you really want is to minimize the number of non-zero columns right, in each of these sections. And the way to address this deficiency is to use a different type of graph called a hypergraph and to partition a hypergraph. And roughly, a hypergraph will have edges that correspond to these columns, right? And you want to minimize the number of these columns that are cut. Okay, so let's look at a definition of a hypergraph. Okay, so like a regular graph, we have a set of vertices and a set of edges. But in hypergraphs, they're called hyperedges. And they're also called nets, so that we use n for, for the set of edges. And the difference between a hyperedge and a regular edge is that a hyperedge can connect more than two vertices. Okay? So in a regular graph, an edge connects exactly two vertices, sometimes only just one vertex by itself. But in a hyperedge, we can connect more than two vertices. So that's maybe a little bit strange. <coughs> 
And just like before, where there, for a sparse matrix, we have a graph, for a sparse matrix, we can also define a hypergraph. Okay? And in, so given a sparse matrix, we have a number of vertices, and they just correspond to the rows of the sparse matrix. And then we also have a number of hyper edges, and they correspond to the columns of the sparse matrix. And the non-zeros in, let's say, column J correspond to the edges, sorry, correspond to the vertices connected by the hyper edge. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So here's a sparse matrix, and here's a hypergraph. And for now, ignore these big circles. Okay, so because there's, they are the partitions that are going to come out from the parti hypergraph partitioning. Okay, so this is an example with uh, 16 rows and 16 columns. Okay, so each row corresponds to a vertex in the hypergraph. Okay, so there will be 16 vertices in the hypergraph. And the vertices are these uh, white circles. Okay, so there should be 16 white circles. Here's uh, V1. Here's a V2, um, V3, okay, uh, up to V16. So here's V16, okay? And there's also 16 columns in the hypergraph, sorry, in the matrix, sparse matrix. That means there are 16 hyper edges, okay? And the first hyper edge corresponding to the first column joins vertex 1, 5, and 10. So it joins three vertices. Okay. And how do we draw a hyper edge? Um, so here in this picture, a hyper edge is drawn with a small dot. Okay, so this is hyper edge one. And there's a line that connects the three vertices, V1, V5, and V10. So 1, 5, and 10 were joined by the first hyper edge. So these are the hyper edges joined by the first one. And then let's take a look at a second example. Uh, this is sometimes why they're called nets, right? They're like joining multiple things together. So, so uh, hyper edge 2 joins 2, 7, and that's it. Joins only 2 and 7. So at hyper edge 2, where is hyper edge 2? So here's 2, and it joins 2 and 7. Okay, so this is the hyper, hyper graph. So given, a, given some sparse matrix, you should be able to draw, the, draw a hyper graph. doesn't even have to be um, square or sy sy symmetric or square. Okay. Now the hyper graph partitioning problem, okay, similar to the graph partition problem, is you want to group the vertices into approximately equal partitions, okay? So just like before, a set of vertices is going to define a set of block rows that will belong to one of the processors. So approximately equal partitions, such that we want to minimize something. So before, we were minimizing the number of edges that were cut. And here, we're going to minimize this sum where the sum is over all the edges that are cut. And for each edge that is cut, we have an associated value which is called lambda. And lambda is the number of parts connected by that edge that is cut, that hyper edge that is cut. Okay? So imagine a hyper edge that connects three parts together. Okay, so let's look at maybe this previous picture. There's, so these are going to be the parts that will be found over here. So there is this hyper edge, N12. It connects three different parts. This part, that part, and that part. Okay, so here lambda 12 is going to be equal to 3. And presumably each hyper edge belongs to some 
part. Okay. So lambda minus one is going to be the number of external parts. Okay, so that explains the minus one. So each hyperedge belongs to a partition, so the number of neighbors is lambda minus one. So this hypergraph partitioning problem is also NP hard. So people again have come up with approximations for finding the partitions. And here's the result of hypergraph partitioning for the, the example that we just saw. And the circles, as you would have guessed, correspond to the partitioning of the vertices. So here we had 12 vertices. We have four partitions. Each partition happens to contain exactly four parts. And now the matrix has been reordered okay, such that the vertices belonging in, to, in each part are ordered together. So part 1 contains 1, 5, 10, and 13. So 1, 5, 10, and 13 are ordered together. Part 2 contains 6, 14, 11, and 3. So those are ordered together. And this is the resulting matrix. And you can see we kind of have minimized the number of non-zero columns. Right? So in this part, so processor 1 only needs x7 in order to do its part of the mat sparse matrix vector product. And that just means that there's one hyperedge that Um, that is that is going to be cut here, right? So it's going to be hyperedge seven. So there's hyperedge seven. Okay. And these two processors, uh, two and three, are going to need x five. That's stored on processor one. Okay. So x five. So that belongs over here, stored on processor 1. It will need to send to processor 2 and processor 3, but not processor 4, because this net doesn't go to processor 4. OK? Any questions about hypergraph partitioning? So the algorithms for partitioning hypergraphs, especially large hypergraphs, are also multi-level. And you can maybe think of how these algorithms might work. So instead of coarsening graphs that have regular edges, you want to coarsen graphs that have hyper edges. Okay? And instead of refining, for instance, using kernighan lin a graph with edges, you want to try to figure out how to refine a graph that has hyper edges. Okay, so it's generalization of all of these components that we saw before. And there's software for this as well. I think I mentioned some, I showed but didn't mention software for graph partitioning. And there's also often the question, well, should I use graph partitioning or hypergraph partitioning? And the main answer is that if you have a mesh that comes from, let's say, a PDE. It's n generally regular enough in the sense that the number of, you know you, you know, you have these nearest neighbor types of connections and the number of neighbors is generally bounded. That regular graph partitioning is usually good enough. Okay? But if you have very unstructured meshes, for instance, meshes that come from circuit simulation, then, then you need to do hypergraph partitioning and it, and it gives a much different answer, a much better answer than from graph partitioning. Okay? Let me show you some examples of graph partitioning. I think that's my last slide. So I have some examples that I will, that I will, uh, on the website. 
So here's a driver for the first example. And I'm not going to use regular meshes because for regular meshes, the answers are too simple. So I'm going to use some unstructured meshes that I've actually showed you before. Um, so I have this data in three columns, x, uh, i, i indices, j indices, and then values. And I make a sparse matrix out of it. And I also have the coordinates of these, of these guys. Okay. And I can uh, reorder using RCM. And I can, just, just so that I have some kind of reordering. And I also reorder the coordinates. And then I'm going to plot. And we can take a look at what that plot looks like. But remember, I have some Dirichlet boundary conditions here. Um, and I want to get rid of those um, in this matrix. So I'm just going to keep the ones that the rows and columns of the matrix that have more than one non-zero. In other words, they have more than just the diagonal entries. OK, so these are the ones that are kept. And then I'm going to try to partition into four parts. OK? And to do that, I'm going to call the Metis library. OK, the Metis is a, Metis is a C library. But I want to call it from MATLAB. So I've written a wrapper function or gateway function to call the C function. And the function requires you to give it a matrix and tell it the number of parts. And the matrix you want to give it is a matrix that does not have a diagonal in it. So I've subtracted off the diagonal. Okay. And the values in the matrix are edge weights. Okay, and this could be very useful because, in general, you might have a problem that have non-uniform edge weights. But here I want to treat edge, each edge to be exactly the same, so each edge weight is going to have a value of 1. So I've constructed this new matrix that doesn't have a diagonal and that has 1s wherever it has a non-zero. Okay? And then this wrapper function returns uh, two things. One is a permutation vector that reorders all of the rows with the same part together. Okay? And then it tells me also the beginning of each part. So the row index of the beginning of each part, the start row of each part. Okay? Then I'm going to reorder the matrix, reorder the coordinates, and then I'm going to plot the um, plot the, uh, the graph. Um, and whenever I plot the graph, I'm going to use the coordinates. OK, so there's a return there that might mean I had something down here as well. OK, so after that plot, I'm going to try to do some more things. I'm going to loop over each part. OK. And for each part, I'm going to plot just that part. And I'm going to plot using a different color. So I'm going to plot the different colors. I'm going to part, plot each part using a different color. OK. And I think the bottom is just some examples for something else. So let's see how that works. OK. So this is um, the graph. It's on a 0 to 1, 0 to 1 domain. And I've removed all of the connections to the uh, Dirichlet boundary. So you can see that it doesn't go all the way to 1. So I've removed those boundaries. And you can see that maybe from this graph that uh, some kind of refinement was used. So there was initially some triangulation, and then each triangle was further refined. Okay, but in any case, it's an unstructured, unstructured graph. And I want to partition this into four parts. Um, 
All right, so, so there's a matrix that I can also plot. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. Um, I want spy A, right? OK, so here's the matrix that has been reordered. So you can imagine that there are four parts. There's one part over here. So there's like, uh, these are the diagonal blocks. And then there's some stuff in these off-diagonal blocks. Okay, We could maybe look at the original matrix, but I didn't plot that. But in any case, the original matrix in RCM ordering looks somewhat banded. And here we have um, tried to minimize the number of these, these uh, to minimize the, the number of non-zeros in the off-diagonal blocks. We've used this partitioning. So let's get rid of this return over here, and then we can look at the, what the partitions look like when I color them. So this will color them in, uh, with different colors. Okay, so this is the result after using Metis to color. Um, using Metis for the four different parts. So you can see that these are the grid points chosen in, for each of the parts. And the number of, of edges that are cut, 218. Okay. Now, if you know the coordinates, there might be a better way of partitioning the graph, especially if the um, if the, if the grid points are relatively uniform in space. And the idea is to partition geometrically. So we could take our original problem. Okay, we could take our original problem, and then we can just say, well, divide space into four parts like this, right? And the number of vertices in each partition should be about the same. Right? And the number of edge, edges that are cut might not be too different from, what was this, 218? 218. Okay, so let's try that as well and see what happens. But you can see that it doesn't give you that, that perfectly um, perfect geometric partition because there were no coordinates that were used in the graph partitioner. So I think this is this example over here. No, this is a, sorry, that's a different example. Okay, it's called geometric partitioning. Okay, so let's see how this works. So this is the same as before. We're going to load the matrix. We're going to keep um, the part of the matrix that doesn't correspond to the boundaries. Then we have these four parts. We're going to look at each. We're going to look at the co the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And if it's uh, both less than 0.5, it's in the first part, second part, third part, fourth part. So we're going to partition geometrically. 
Okay, then we're going to construct an ordering vector. So this is a very lazy way of finding the ordering vector. And then we're going to look at the matrix. And then we're going to go through the, each part and we're going to plot the graph in different colors corresponding to each part. And then we're going to count the number of cut edges. And we're going to see if that's how that compares to 218. Let me clear everything first. Okay. All right, so this is the matrix that corresponds to the geometric partitioning. Here are the blocks, and here are the off-diagonal entries. Okay. And w there's some minimization of the um, so these are basically the ones that are in between two parts, right? So there's some minimization of the number of elements in the off-diagonal parts, uh, off-diagonal blocks. And we could try to reorder within each block, and it'll probably give us something similar to what we saw before. And then here is the geometric partitioning, right? So we partition space into four parts. Uh, and remember, the only reason why we could do that was because we did have the coordinates, and it made sense to do it because the coordinates are relatively uniformly distributed in space. Okay? And then the total number that was cut, 235. Okay? So Midas gave us 218, and we got 235. So does that make sense? Should it be more or should it be less? I think it should be a little bit more because Midas tries to do a really good job. It tries to just optimize the number of, minimize the number of edges that are cut, right, without, uh, even though it doesn't have any of the coordinates. So it didn't produce something that looked as nice, perhaps, as the second example. But the second example, we weren't specifically trying to minimize the number of edges that were cut, right? But we got something that is close and slightly worse, I think, is to be expected. Okay, any questions about that? I'll post these uh, codes that I've demonstrated as well. Uh, yeah, question. So, uh, can you, uh, so you just show us the uh, edge card. Uh, can you say a few words about the uh, comparison between edge card and vertex card? Yeah, it's sort of a query, I guess. It's, uh, yeah, so Yeah, so codes generally um, find cut edges. It's a little bit easier for them to find cut edges. If you want to find cut vertices, that generally involves an extra step. And that, and it can be done at, in at least two ways. One way is to um, start with a vertex cut and to start with an edge cut and to derive a vertex cut from that. For instance, by taking one of the vertices on one side of the, of the edge cut. Um, and you may have to do some more to make sure that it's actually a, an actually a cut. And the other way to do it is to construct something called a dual of the graph, okay, where basically edges are now vertices, or vertices are edges, something like that. And then to apply the standard algorithm, which gives us a, a edge cut, and then convert back to the original, which would give us a, a vertex cut. So that's how you would do it in an automatic way. Now, if you have a problem that is given to you, it may be more natural in the problem to find a partition that is a vertex cut or more natural to find a, find a partition that is an edge cut. So, so it is really problem dependent um, in that case. 
but if you're just given a a graph, then generally an edge cut will be would would be sought. Um, and I don't know if there's an advantage of one over the other. It really, I think it would be problem dependent. Any other questions? Okay, in the last 10 minutes, I want to go through some of the solutions to the exercises that you guys have been, uh, that you guys have been working on. And I've posted them. They're very rough solutions, but I've posted them so that you don't have to copy this down right now. Okay, so let's start with this one. So I believe this is from uh, lecture three. We had a lecture on sparse matrix data structures. And we wanted to find the jagged diagonal format for a matrix in natural ordering corresponding to this grid. So this grid in natural ordering. So it's a 4 by 4 grid. Okay. And this is a picture of the matrix. And if we use the center differences um, for the second derivatives, we get these values. Okay. So it's a 16 by 16 matrix. And to construct a jagged diagonal format, what I did first is I first put it into LPAC format. Okay, so in LPAC format, I've just taken all of the elements in each row and I've just shifted them to the left. So that's LPAC format. So if you look at the, this again, I've just, taken, I've just taken each row and I've just listed each row, all the elements in each row. And LPAC format stores this along with the column indices in this dense array. So all of these extra things that are blank are explicitly stored zeros. Okay. And in jagged diagonal format, the, we try to avoid storing these explicit zeros, ex storing these zeros by sorting the rows in decreasing number of non-zeros. Okay. So here I've sorted the rows. I said, well, Started with these, so these are the longest ones, one, two, three, four. Then the next longest ones, five, six, etc. And then these are the rows that are sorted from longest to shortest. Okay. And in jagged diagonal format, we're going to store the first column, second column, third column, fourth column up to here, and then the fifth column. So none of these additional non none of these additional zeros are stored. And we're going to store these column indices as well. So down over here, I started writing down the column indices. 1, 2, 5. They correspond to 1, 2, 5. This is 1, 2, 3, 6, et cetera. Okay. And then these column indices have to be stored in the same order. So the first one is 2, 5, 6, 7, 10, which corresponds to this one. Okay, so this is the permutation vector that is needed to sort the rows into the right order. So these formats, like L, these basically based on LPAC, they're very popular for GPUs and for uh, accelerators, coprocessors, because they're able to do these long loops these long loops, if you have like a million by a million matrix, these long loops that are length a million rather than these short loops over the rows. Okay, so that was uh, one of them. Another exercise was more recent computing the sparse approximate inverse of the tridiagonal matrix, twos on the diagonal and minus ones on the off diagonal. And this is the answer that I got. And a lot of you got this answer as well. And you notice that the middle ones, you guys would have noticed that the middle ones are the same. So in fact, computing sparse approximate inverses 
for problems that are very regularly structured can be very cheap because all these internal ones are the same. The ones corresponding to internal grid points are the same. And it's interesting to compare th these values to the values of the exact inverse. Okay? Um, something that you'll notice is that the values are very different. And we're not trying to compute an approximation to the values in the inverse. We're actually trying to compute an approximation to this way, which can give us something that is very different. I computed the optimal value, and you can compute that two ways, either directly or through the formula, the trace of the weight matrix minus the trace of G times A. You can do that. Okay, so that was another one. Okay. Um, So I had also a problem of a regular grid and a spiral ordering. So this is just a smaller example of the one that I gave you. I was thinking of giving you uh, a really big example so that you could not do it by hand. You'd have, actually, you would have to figure out how to, how, uh, what the relations actually are. But the way to figure it out is to actually do a smaller example by hand. So um, the arrows here point from smaller to larger because they're all um, lower triangular. This is a lower for a lower triangular matrix, and this is the mat the lower triangular matrix that you get, right? So for one, there's an edge to two, th four, six, and eight, right? So one points to two, four, six, and eight. 2 has an edge to 9, 3 has an edge to 4, and no others. 5 has an edge to 4 has an edge to 5. So this is the rest of the matrix. Okay, so if we do triangular solves, how many levels are there? Right, so 1 is in the first level, 2 is in the second level, it depends on 1. Okay, what else is in the second level? What else only depends on 1? 4 depends on 1, but it also depends on 3, which hasn't been done yet. Right? So the only thing in the second level is 2. And the only thing in the third level is 3. And the only thing in the fourth level is 4. So, and you can see that from this graph that, that node i always depends on node i minus 1. So the number of levels in this case is 9. And in the larger example you had, which was 25 nodes, the number of levels is 25. Okay. So this kind of explains how the arrows, you have to really pay attention to the arrows. You can't just do a breadth-first expansion, not paying in attention to the direction of the arrows to, to determine the number of levels there are. Okay. And then one of the more recent ones using level, using uh, partition inverses. So trying to find the number of partitions in this partition inverse. And I copied, one of you wrote this, and I didn't want to draw the graph again, so I just copied it. So I don't know who, who, who it was. You recognize your, your own writing, I guess. So this is the graph, and in the square brackets is the depth. And these are the num this is the numbering, right? In the circles is the numbering. And one question I asked myself, well, this represents a lower triangular matrix. If I take the inverse of the lower triangular matrix, will there be any fill-in, any additional non-zeros in the structure? If there's none, then it's all one partition, right? But there are edges um, because this edge from 2 to 12 would be in the transitive closure of this graph. So this is a fill-in edge, and these other ones are fill-in edges as well. So the inverse must have fill-in. So you know that the answer cannot be just one partition. Okay. And remember, in the algorithm, whenever you add a node to consider, you're going to add all of the elements in its row, in other words, all of the emanating edges. So here is what I was trying to do. So 1 and 2, OK, no fill in. 3, 
no fill in, four, no fill in, five, no fill in, six, six doesn't even have any emanating edges, so no fill in, and then seven, if we add seven, then we're going to get this four, seven, eleven, which has a, a path that could be joined over here. So that would have been a fill-in. So 7 is where we would have to stop and begin a new partition. And then if you finish all of the rest, you see that nothing else gets added. So the answer is two partitions. In the original order that I showed, there were four partitions. In this order, there are two partitions from 1 to 6 and 7 to 12. Okay, any questions? Okay. So if you haven't noticed, the uh, second assignment has been posted and it's also due on Friday. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. Have a good night. So there's no oh, yes. Do you want to have a... <laughs> I had two of... I, thank you for the reminder. I have two things planned. I don't know which one to give you. Um, let me give you the... Uh, the first thing that I have planned. So I checked in the multi, the one-dimensional multi-grid example, but I did not run them in class for you. So the very simple thing to do is to download those files and then run them. And one of the parameters for the driver program is the size of the problem, like 63. So a one-dimensional problem, 63. And then you could try a larger problem, 127. They all have to be odd numbers that are powers of 2 minus 1 for me to generate coarse grid sizes. So run them with different problem sizes and, and they all run for 10 uh, V cycles. And take a look at what is the residual after each one of these uh, after each one of these, so after 10 V cycles. And you should be able to see that after 10 V cycles, no matter how large the problem size, the residual is always about the same, which I think, if you've never seen this before, can be a little bit surprising because you have larger and larger problems, but the number of iterations and the amount of work stays about the same no matter the problem size. Okay, so I think that's a very easy thing to try to follow up on the multigrid lecture. All right, thanks very much.